All right. If you would, please open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8. As we look at Memorial Day, the initial thought I had was actually when the children of Israel crossed into the land of Canaan under the leadership of Joshua and the river Jordan parted. And if you remember, uh, they pulled out 12 stones from that river and set them up as a memorial, something to remember so that when the people walked by in that particular area and saw the stones, they would remember God's faithfulness. But as I kept praying, the Lord led me to this passage. And um, so we're going to walk through it and make some reflections on it. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 8. If you remember, Deuteronomy is the last sermon of Moses. This is the last thing that Moses said the person that was the mediator between the first covenant between the people of Israel and God. And he was there as the physical mediator. Jesus is the second mediator of a new covenant. And another, the second, another man. But anyway, so Moses had these things to say to the people of Israel on his last day that he would get to address them. So the book of Deuteronomy, although most people don't find that as a great reading, um, is a very rich book of the last things that Moses had to say to the people before he passed. And uh, so the chapter that we're going to look at in my Bible is entitled, Remember the Lord. And we're going to talk about three tests that he mentions in this entire chapter. I told some of the teenagers that we'd be here at about seven tonight. Y'all believe me. All right. But... Um, so anyway, but we're going to kind of walk through this passage as uh, Moses is telling the people about what God has done in their lives, what God is about to do in their lives, and what's going to happen in the future, and the temptations that's going to come there, the testings that God has given, is giving, and will give, and how they should handle it, and the consequences of those actions. And so we would be good as a people, whether in the church or in the United States, to heed this lesson. Because it's true of all peoples. And we, we divide uh, nations, churches, congregations, counties, governments. The word there is im in the Greek. It just means people. So where you got more than one person, you got people. So any type of group of people is what he's talking about. And understand that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, which what was the first group that was created? Adam and Eve, which is a family. So when God addresses people, he always starts at the root. It always comes back to the family. It always comes back to the home. So as the homes go in a nation, so goes the nation. All right. That was a freebie. Merry Christmas. All right. I almost said Romans 8. I like Romans 8, but we're in Deuteronomy 8. Here we go. You must carefully follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter the possession of the land the Lord swore to your fathers. Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your fathers had not known, so that you might learn 
that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Your clothing did not wear out, and your feet did not swell these 40 years. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> the test of want. And I know that's kind of an old phrase, so the test of need. The testing of needs. You remember Jesus had a lot to say, you people, why do you, you fret over what you're going to eat, over what you're going to wear? Really? Look at the birds. Look at the grass. Look how they're adorned. Does your father not care more about you? The testing of needs. How much have you worried about what you were going to eat this week? Oh, come. How many of you that eat on Wednesday nights went to see what we were eating Wednesday night? How many of you are thinking about lunch right now? Now I am, Brother Reagan, thanks. <laughs> right? You already had preparations for it. We worry so much about those things. We worry especially about it when we don't have anything. And the question is, when you don't have anything, what do you seek? Do you seek your own way or do you seek God's way? Do you seek your own provision for yourself or do you seek God to provide for what you need? See, that's very important to the Lord. He wants to know if he's really first. And the way to know that too is to test your basic desires. That's why fasting is so important as a spiritual discipline in one's life. So that you're not controlled by your appetites. If you remember, in those 40 years in the wilderness... Their appetites got them into a lot of trouble. Go back and read it. All we have is this manna. We don't have any meat. It would be nice if we had a piece of some meat to put in between our bread. But, you know, of all the things they could whine about, they could have gripped about the hot desert, they could have, but what were they concerned about? Their belly. And God tested them on this. I'm going to test you. To say, and why did he test them on that? He wanted to know what was what? What was in their hearts. Do you seek your own or do you seek me? So a lot of people don't even pass that test. They get tested a little bit. They get tested that their, 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 their income might go down. Their, their lifestyle, they may have to cut back. They may have to not get what they want. And well, they forget God. I've got to look after me and my own and take care of my family. Because I'm in charge, Right? And one said, well, the Lord gave me my family. i got to take care of them. So, no, 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 no. The Lord first gave you himself. You were made in his image. You give him what's his. And that's you. See, the Lord tests our hearts in this. He lets us have nothing. You don't hear that preach on Sunday mornings, do you? The Lord will give you nothing. He wants to see what's in your heart. When this nation started, we didn't walk over here and there was a McDonald's on every corner. It was a wilderness. 
the people came here, and most of them died. Through winters, through hardships, through trials, through suffering, they didn't know how to do anything until the Indians taught them how to plant. <laughs> right? I mean, we take for granted, didn't it? Let's just be honest. And it wasn't just in those early years. Throughout the history of this nation, we have gone through trials and tribulations. The Lord has brought us down to our knees where we had nothing. More so in the uh, 1600s and 1700s and 1800s and the 1900s because we were very blessed over those two world wars that transformed our nation. But we'll get to that in a minute. But we went through some lean years. And the heart of our nation was tested. Would we rely on God or would we would rely on ourselves? It really is the basic desire is, and remember what he says, the reason they could tell you, Jesus actually quotes it when he's tempted. He turned that stone into bread and he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This was a lesson Israel was supposed to learn. Jesus, being an Israelite, said, I know this lesson. <laughs> we were tested in the wilderness. I know this lesson. We don't depend on it. God will take care of our daily bread. He'll give us manna if we have to. Now, what is manna? Mm -hmm. What does that word mean? Anybody know? I thought I'd touch on this. It's real simple. Manna means, what is it? What is it? They walked out and said, Mana, Mana, Mana. Well, that was the name of it. <laughs> what is it? What is it? Because they didn't know what it was. And they tried to define it to us. But it was bread from heaven. It was just crazy. What is it? That is the de definition of living paycheck to paycheck. That is the definition of not knowing where your food's going to come from. That is the definition of having to completely depend upon someone else for your needs. Because you open the pantry and say, what is that? <laughs> it's a can of some kind of meat called spam. How many of you love spam? Anybody? few of us. You know, that's that, that's that can that sits in the back there that never ruins, that we don't have anything else. You put that over the ramen noodles, right? If you're lucky. But see, we think that's bad. Most of the world would love to have that. 60% of the world lives on rice. Then the other 20% actually have beans to go on top of it. Very few people actually get to eat like we eat. Anyway, food. What is it? And God led them to this point of complete reliance and complete dependence upon him. That's why the obedience that God desires us to have is not in these great actions. It's a simple obedience of getting up and going to church, getting up and going to work getting up and doing your tithe and, and praying on your knees and reading your Bible every day. It's the little things, that are, because the little things show your heart. What do you really believe about your relationship with him? And the mottos of ungodly trust and those things come as a result of the basic desires of our heart. The test of want, the test of need. When you are tested and you don't have, do you trust in yourself and rely on your own ingenuity? Or do you trust in and rely upon God? It's mosey on the five. Keep in mind that the Lord your God has been disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. 
So keep the commands of the Lord God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams of water, springs, deep water sources, flowing in both valleys and hills, a land of wheat, barley, vines, figs, pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without shortage where you will lack nothing, a land whose rocks are iron and from whose hills you will mine copper. When you eat and are full, you will praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. I think about how we bought Alaska for a million dollars. I think it was a million, four million maybe, somewhere in there. We probably got that the first year in gold. My, how we have been blessed. And how we went into all those places where the forest had been untouched and the ground was a deep, black, rich soil. And God blessed this nation with so much. And with the people had the ingenuity to create ways to get this vast wilderness and turn it into the nation that it is. A nation that produces most of the world's food, most of the world's stuff, or it did anyway. That's later. <laughs> Why did we do that? The test of discipline. The test of discipline, or rather, the test of character. When we think of discipline, we think, you know, we have a lot of ideas on that. That's why I say character. What good is a land full of potential with someone who's lazy? What good is a land full of opportunity with the people that don't want to work? A hungry man knows how to work. And that's why God led them through the wilderness. He led them through the tough times so that when they came to a land of opportunity, they'd know what to do. They knew that if they wanted to have it, they had to go get it. We live in a generation that gets out of whack when they have only one bar on their phone. <laughs> they don't know what to do. What are we going to do today? We live in a generation that we wouldn't know what to do if we didn't have it come out of a can. If it wasn't in a box pre-made. There's something to be said, I've been thinking about this all morning. There's something to be said about what you learn when you plant a little thing in the ground and you wait for months for a little leaf and then you wait for more months for there to be fruit. Then that, that tomato or whatever it is tastes a little bit better than it does in the store because of the patience and the time and you value that thing. It's worth more than money. There's a discipline in a character that God expects when he gives you stuff. He expects you to remember what it was when you had nothing. There are many ways that God could have led them, but he led them through the worst possible route ever. Some of you feel like, well, man, you just described my life. <laughs> you just described half of my life, man. There's a reason God did that. He was disciplining you as a child. He wanted you to understand the value of the things that he was going to give you so that when you gave them, you would be a good steward of it. And he didn't give them a shabby land. He said, you're going to have more food than you know what to do with. 
you're going to have trash bags full of stuff that people would covet after. I still remember the day that I was in the Dominican Republic, and those of you who know me know that it takes me a long time to eat. Do y'all know that? If you don't know that, just come to the next fellowship. Come Wednesday night and watch me eat a sloppy joe. It's not a pretty sight, okay? But it'll take me an hour. And so I'm on a mission trip, and in mission trips, you have to be flexible, and, and, and you have to be quick, which me, eating and quick, do not, they're not in the same, I'd say paragraph, but that's, they're not even in the same book. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, and I, I've got a sandwich, and they said, do you want a soda? I'm like, yes, I would love a soda. So I'm thinking, you know, a soda. But you don't have a variety in other countries like we do. I need a 12 ounce can or do you? no, they come with a soda. This big old honking thing, this literally, this tall glass. I'm like, good night. They yeah, 15 minutes. I'm like, I can't even open the sandwich wrapper in 15 minutes. So I'm sitting there just going and guzzling and doing everything I can. I finally get down the sandwich because I knew I needed that, but I had about half that soda left. And he had a, the, we were in a Haitian village, so he had all those little Haitian boys around because that was money in my hand. That bottle was money. So they were waiting for that bottle, about 10 of them. And so they said, okay, it's time to go, and I had half that bottle left. And so I handed it to him. I walked away. And, was, and I looked back, and there they were, all of them, handing it because they didn't get that. See, we toss aside gold. We look down upon things that the world would love to have. We have no idea the good land that we live in. How God has prospered us. And he expects us as good sons to have his heart with our stuff. Whether it be food, whether it be weapons, whatever God has blessed us with a mind to have, he expects us to honor him with it. And this is what Moses is teaching his people. Number one, God gave you nothing for 40 years. Now he's going to give you everything. And that was a discipline so that you remember what you didn't have, so you respect what you have. And you remember that everybody's the same. You were slaves in Egypt and they mistreated you. So when you become powerful, you have to treat others the way you would have wanted to be treated. The test of character, the test of discipline. Am I going to be the person that I am now when I have everything, that, not that I need, everything that I want. What is the result that is expected? Verse 10. When you eat and are full, you will praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. What is the result that God expects of disciplined children? Obedience, yes, but praise. Thanks and praise. What God expects from a people that have been blessed is thanksgiving and praise. <laughs> he expects that. Not when we're at war. Not when there's a drought. When there's problems. That's how the pagans act. God's children understand that when they are bountifully supplied, that's when they should be at church. Because they didn't do it on their own. All the things that you have, all the things that worry us, because the more you have, the more you have worry, right? 
You know what I'm talking about? If you have multiple cars in your driveway, that means you have multiple worries. Because this one's not working, and that, that's why you got multiple cars. Because one of them ain't working half the time. And that's the nature of stuff. It's just the pain. And those of you who have stuff, you know what I'm talking about. You gotta have a place to store it. You gotta have a place to put it. And then you gotta worry about it. And then it gets worked. And it gets rusty. And then you gotta go buy a battery because it don't work. And then, right? That's just the nature of stuff. And God says, listen, you could have nothing. You better thank me for that problem. Praise should be the result. And then the rest of the chapter he reserves for the final test. And the final test is the test of wealth and power. And it's pride versus humility. Pride Versus humility. Be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God, verse 11, by failing to keep his command, the ordinances and the statutes. I am giving you today, when you eat and are full, and build beautiful houses to live in, and your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold multiply, and everything else you have increases, be careful be careful that your heart does not become proud and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the place of slavery he led you through the great terrible wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions, a thirsty land where there was no water. He brought water out of the flint like rock for you. He fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers had not known in order to humble and test you so that in the end he might cause you to prosper. You may say to yourself, my own power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord your God gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant he swore to your fathers as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods to worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will perish. Like the nations, the Lord is about to destroy before you. You will perish if you do not obey the Lord your God. The testing of wealth and power. What do we do with our wealth and our power? There are a couple of things that I think while we, you know, people will say, if God doesn't destroy our nation. He's going to have to show, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if, you know, and all these calls for judgment. Let me explain something to you. There are a couple of things that make this nation great. And when God looks at it, there's a million things that he can frown upon, but he can do that with any people. But there are some things about this nation that make us great. We are the number one nation in the world that gives to people. China don't do it, Russia don't do it, Britain don't do it, Europe don't do it, no one does it. When the world's in trouble, they come to us. And it's not our government that gives it, it's the people. It's the people. We have more 501c3 nonprofit organizations that you can shake a stick at. Because we have a heart, we have been given, and we want to give. The other reason is because we are a friend of the first covenant people. That's Israel, if you're wondering. It's not a dumb thing for us to move our embassy into Jerusalem. The more we recognize them as a people, God will continue to recognize us as a people. 
And the more that we act, imitate God's heart by being generous and kind to even the people who are not to us, even though they may mistreat us and battle us in ways that we don't, shouldn't, we shouldn't turn the t- tables and act the same way they do. God expects more from his children than he does from everybody else. (laughs) And we should act appropriately. No other nations claim to be under him, except for Israel. But we do. And that comes with a blessing and a curse. Did you catch that? It comes with a blessing and a curse. And this is what he and these are the people of the first covenant. He said, listen, it's going to go well for you as long as you listen. But when you get proud and your belly gets full and your house has all the good stuff on it and you've got a bunch of cars in your driveway and you've got an extra house down the road and you've got all, and you got cattle in both places and you're sitting fat and you're sitting pretty and you assert your head and say, look at me and all I've done. He said, it'll be taken from you like that. You start chasing after other gods and you forget who gave you everything you've got. You were slaves over there. And God brought you here. You used to be a colony. You used to have to give all your taxes to England. And by the blood of your own people, you you took off that yoke. And you knew nothing, but now you know wealth. What do you do with it? You had no power. You had to ask France, France for help. But now they come to you for help. What do you do with your power? We've seen the tyranny from, from the kings of England to the tyrant that was in Germany. We've seen so many things, and we have used our wealth, and we have used our power, not only for the protection of our people, but for the protection of all people. And we still have tyrants who live in this day. We've seen the Bin Ladens. We've seen the Husseins. We have others that will come with different names. And while we have a weapon in one hand, we should have a sandwich in the other. Because it's not all the people that are that way. And we should help those who have need. Amen. That's the way God does. He had a whole world that had rebelled against him. A whole world that had turned their backs to him, that had left the garden and created their own cities and their own things and their own ways. But at the proper time, he gave his son. He said, I, I come with a sword, I come to split your families, but here, the first person I kill is me. The first person I'll kill is me. The first person that receives judgment is me. I'll take the penalty. I'll take the loss. I'll take the debt. Be imitators of God as dearly loved children. It doesn't mean that we ignore the wrong. No, we confront it. But we confront it with the willingness to sacrifice and to give. We've done that since we've existed. And yeah, it's been with other tyranny outside of our nation. We've unfortunately even had it in our own nation with the Civil War. We've seen some stuff. But God has blessed us. I'm just thankful that the power don't go out. That was the most frustrating thing in the Dominican Republic. I mean, you just say, all of a sudden, boom, everything. We just don't realize how blessed we are and how good we got it sitting in air conditioning in a 100 degree day. Some of you remember why these windows are here. Because you used to have to raise them and fan the whole time. Because there was no AC. Of all the things that God has given you, how much of your lips say praise to God? Or are you negative and complaining, grumpy and gripey about the things that God gave you? You might want to remember when you had nothing. Because you might get it back if you're not careful. (laughs) 
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this nation. We thank you for the lives that our soldiers have given so that we could be fruitful and multiply and prosper, that we could mine those hills and get the gold out of it, that we could uh, invent ways to take that sand and turn it into silicon and then turn it into computers. And Lord, it's just crazy the stuff that we come up with sometimes. And you've been so faithful to us. But Lord, as we come to you, may we turn our face and not our backs. May we not assert to ourselves that we have built our own kingdom and that we've established this by our own hands. But Lord, may we humble ourselves before you with the things that you have given us. Lord, they're yours, and we ourselves are yours. We were in bondage to sin, enslaved to it, but you called us out of darkness into yourself. You redeemed us, Lord. We owe you everything. Help us to be faithful with what we have and with who we are. Love you. Amen. Would you stand with me, please?